want you to imagine for just a second that you're at a, uh, a meeting for work or maybe it's a banquet for work or a Christmas party or something like that. And it, at some point in the meeting, the boss stands up and tinks his glass to get everybody's attention. And he says, I've got something really important I need to talk to you about. The hush comes over the crowd. And the first thing he says is, I'm leaving. I'm stepping out. And here's what I want you to do. Don't worry. This is going to be good. All right? So as soon as you hear those things, some people are going to be immediately with, what, you're leaving? And forget everything else that's said, right? Some people are going to be going, yeah, sure, this is going to be better, right? And, but, but how many people in that immediately are going to pick up on and, and, and tune into, so here's what I want you to do. Very few, actually, are going to do that. And, and, and then in the middle of that, um, somebody asks a question. So, so where are you going? Right? And, and answer that, weave his way back to, but here's what I want you to do. And somebody asks a question, well, uh, how, how are we going to, he'll answer that and weave his way back to, but here's what I want you to do. How many times would he have to cycle back to that before the people really get the point? Okay, can you picture that in your mind? Because that's the situation that we have in our scripture today. We're still in the upper room. And uh, last week we looked at that, uh, but we're still in the upper room here. And um, if you've been tracking with us in this series the last couple of weeks, today is Palm Sunday. Well, we looked at that two weeks ago, if you were here. We changed the timeline from our normal timeline just because I wanted to take three or four weeks here to look at what happens in this last week of Jesus' life. So we started that a couple of weeks ago. We looked at Palm Sunday as Jesus rode into Jerusalem uh, on the donkey. He stopped and wept over Jerusalem. We looked at his passion, his priority there in, in his heart for the lostness of that town and how he came and they missed, they missed it. Then last week we were in the upper room as Jesus washed their feet and then they celebrated the Passover together and again, we saw Jesus' heart really clearly in that. Um, as he said, I'm giving you a new covenant. It's a new way of connecting with God. It's a whole new deal from here on. And he gave them a new commandment, too. And we talked about it. So, to, to love one another. Love people like I loved you, is what he said. So that's what we have here today. And in the middle of this this dinner where they're talking about these things and he's sharing his heart and his priorities, Jesus drops a bomb. And it's in John chapter 13. And as Ken said, we really need to have a Bible today. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> There's a bunch we're going to read, but, but I really want to go through John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. John is the only one that records this. Uh, last week in the upper room, all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all talk about the, the Last Supper. Uh, John was the only one that talked about washing the feet. And in each of the other Gospels, they, they uh, have the Last Supper, Judas leaves, and then they leave and go to the garden and he's arrested. John has six pages between there and there. And it's the biggest chunk of teaching in one setting that Jesus does, that John records. There's two other big chunks, both of them Matthew record. The Sermon on the Mount, and at the end of Matthew, he talks about the end of the world for several pages. But those three big chunks of teaching, this is the one we hardly ever talk about. And obviously, uh, they spent quite a bit more time in that upper room after they ate, as Jesus talks through all these kind of things. Look at John chapter 13, Verse 33, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, 
Where I am, you cannot come. Jesus says, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. You can't come. Now, he's been telling them this for a number of weeks already. I don't think that they're getting it. But he doesn't talk about it lots here. He drops that, I'm leaving, you can't come, and then he goes straight into the next thing. Here's what I want you to do. Look at verse 34 and 35. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And we talked about that quite a bit last week. One of the things I said last week was that the, that phrase one another is a, is a reciprocal word, but it's a duplicate word. He's, what he's saying is, the way I've loved you, duplicate that in other people. And, and, and Jesus talks about that uh, his whole life. He's not saying, love, there, there's 11 of you left in the room. Love each other so well that everybody wants in this group. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, love duplicating the way I loved you. Love everyone. There, there isn't a parameter around that. Love. And Jesus taught this from the very beginning. He lived this. He oozed this. And when they came to him and said, what's the most, command, most important commandments? He says, they're all summed up in this. Love God and love people. And so he had taught this so much from, from the prophecies way back in Jeremiah, right through the Gospels. Bind up the brokenhearted. Release the captives. Uh, set those in bondage free. Uh, heal the sick. Restore. Re reconnect. This is how Jesus lived. And now he's saying it in these words. Love people the way I loved you. This is Jesus' last command in that sense. A few weeks ago, uh, we were talking about uh, what I referred to as the last lecture. And we were talking about the prayer that Jesus prays in this context and, and showing his priorities, his last opportunity to sit down with his disciples and lay it all out for them. And that's what he does. So if you can imagine in your mind, Jesus stands up at the dinner, tinks his glass, has everybody's attention, clears his throat and says... I'm leaving, here's what I want you to do, okay? If you can get that in your mind and wedge that in there, everything we go through this morning comes back to those two things, all right? And, and John here writes a lot about that here, but you know, 50 years later, John is still writing about this. The book of 1 John is pretty much all about that, love like Jesus loved, Walk like Jesus walked. Continue the work that Jesus did. John, I think, gets this more than the others did. And so, he says, I'm leaving. Here's what I want you to do. And look at verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? All right, so assuming that half the people in the room or more, I'm leaving. Here's what I want you to do. They jumped all over the I'm leaving part. Miss the, here's what I want you to do, right? Here's what I want you to do, love people. And, and then Peter immediately, where are you going? That's what he says. Uh, it continues on. Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly I say to you, the roast rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Did Peter even hear the new commandment? He certainly heard that Jesus was leaving and he kind of gets stuck there. Does that ever happen to you? That's happened to me. I, I know that. If somebody says something and I get stuck there and I'm thinking about that and it goes on and on and on and I miss all of that because he said that. That happens to us. We get that. I understand that. But Jesus doesn't all of a sudden just stop and jump back to his main point. He talks about that. He answers that question. And they continue to work through. And actually, the whole rest of these chapters, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, 
Jesus does exactly that. Go back to the, to the boss standing up. I'm leaving. Here's what I want you to do. It's going to be better. Somebody asks a question. He comes and answers the question, goes back to his point. Somebody asks a question. He answers the question, goes back to his point. And, and, and in these five, four or five chapters here, Jesus actually cycles around that five times and says the same thing over and over and over and over to get his point, his point across. We're going to walk through the first time of that today. I'll make reference to some of the others, but I want us to see that cycle that goes on here. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards. And Peter said, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus said, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who record this same conversation, spend a lot of time on that Jesus-Peter dialogue and the denying part. John just mentions it in passing. But then later when it happens, and then as Jesus meets with John even afterwards to restore and recoup, John writes way more about that. It's really interesting. We'll come back to that denial part if we have time at the end. But I want to keep going here. Uh, John chapter 14. Jesus is still on the topic of him leaving, answering Peter's question. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it, were not, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go prepare a place for you? And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Let's stop there for a second. I kind of get the feeling that the disciples are, are mildly freaking out here. Right? When Jesus says, I'm leaving, he's told them over and over, but they haven't got it yet. And, and you can't leave now. You're going to be the king. We've just had the big parade a couple of days ago and came into town. Uh, and then I wonder if in the middle of this, Jesus just says, don't worry. Don't worry. Trust me. Believe in me. Believe in God. Trust me. Don't worry. I'll come and take you there. I'll come and take you there. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's giving them a hope, right? There's, there's a future in this. Now, they would have absolutely recognized that language. We've talked about this before, too. That, that when a, a, a Jewish man and woman were getting engaged, he would travel to her house and stay there for a while, and they would get to know each other. And then at the engagement point, he would say to her, I'm going to my father's house. I'm preparing a place for you. When the time is right, I will come and get you and take you to be with me in my father's house. That's wedding engagement language. And they would have known that there. They would have absolutely applied that. That would not be strange to them. And Jesus is painting a picture. There is hope. We will be together forever, he's saying. So don't worry about this. I'm going to come and get you. And he says, you know the way. And Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we get there? How, how, how do we know the way? We don't even know where you're going. And look at Jesus' answer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Jesus says, um, I am the way. If you had really known me, he says. Isn't that interesting? But you know, when, when Jesus says, I am the way, that's, he's not the first person that has ever said that. If you study any Hindu history, uh, they have recorded that, that I am the way is a phrase because they believe that, that always on earth, at any time in history on earth, there is always one person that is the way. 
they, will, they, they teach that. And so if you understand that, they, they look at this and say, yeah, he says that because at earth at that time he was the way. And lots of other people. But Jesus doesn't just say, I am the way. He takes it way further. What else does he say? Jesus says, I am the way. He says, I am what is true. And I am the source of life. That takes this claim to a whole new level. That's what those things, when he says, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That's what he's saying. I am truth itself. I am what is true. I am life itself, literally and figuratively. He says, I am the way to the Father. No one comes to the Father but through me. And then look at verse verse 8. Philip sticks in another question. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. It's like, he, he says, if you had known me, you would have known the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Philip, on, on his little rabbit trail now, right, being this way, he goes, oh, show us the Father. That's all we really need. We just really want to know the Father. Show us the Father. He didn't listen at all to what Jesus said. So this is the second time, the third time, the question, Jesus is saying this, and the question goes, bing, way over there. Jesus calls it back, saying this, is bing. This is the third time the questions have gone in a different direction. Jesus doesn't do anything except respond. He says, Have I been with you so long and you just still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me and does his works Believe me that I am in the Father, the Father's in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Jesus says, Philip, how long have you known me? You want to see the Father? He says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In, in verse um, 6 and then verse 7, know me. If you know me, you know the Father. Verse 7. In verse 9, if you've seen me, if you've seen the Father. In verse 10, I am in the Father, the Father's in me. In verse 11, again, I am in the Father, the Father's in me. And then he basically says, that's why I do everything I do. You know that. We've been through that a bunch of times, he says. Now, if this was me, I'd be getting a little exasperated already at this point, right? I'm leaving. Here's what I want you to do. And all the questions are all about everything other than here's what I'm trying to say to you, right? And he, he doesn't. He doesn't get exasperated here. He just very gently comes back to the point and he says, love like I loved you. Love like I loved you. Verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Do the works that I do. Now, let me stop there for a second because a few times over the last few years, we've talked about what it means to be a disciple. And a, and a rabbi would collect his disciples together at a young age. They would grow up. They would learn. That would be their schooling uh, at, at 12 years old, at 15 years old, and we've talked about that before. If you want to hear more about that now, I can talk about that another time. But at 16 years old, school would be done, and the rabbi would call out one or two of them and say, follow me. And that would mean for the next 12, 15 years, study and learn and become exactly like the rabbi. By the time you're 30, then you're a rabbi, and you carry on the rabbi's work exactly as the rabbi did. See? So when Jesus says to them, do the works I do, that's not foreign to them. This is the natural process of being a disciple. That's what it's leading to. And so Jesus says to them, do what I do. I love the next part here. Do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in his Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. 
you will do even greater things because I'm going to the Father. Now that would have been weird for them, right? Because we've got you right here. We can look you in the eye. We can talk to you every day. But if you're gone and you go to the Father, how can we do even more and beyond? And then Jesus gives them a direct connect to the power of God. Ask. Ask in my name, he says. Carry on my work. Now, we've talked about that a lot of times, too, about what name means. It doesn't mean that I'm going to say in Jesus' name. At the end of a prayer or in a prayer, or I'm praying for someone to be healed, and I say in the name of Jesus, that's not what that means, ask in the name. In the name means his character, his person, his essence, his priorities, his passion, everything to do with who this person is, you're in that, okay? So if this is everything Jesus is about, if I'm in there, I'm in his name. If I'm out here, I'm not. So when we pray, am I praying along with Jesus' heart and his desires and his character? Then ask anything and he will do it. That's what he's saying. And actually, seven times in these chapters, he says, in my name. We'll come back to those a couple in a little bit. So he's saying, uh, carry on my work. Carry on my name, my reputation. Carry on my ways, my priorities. Uh, Be in me. This was part of being a, a disciple, to become exactly like your rabbi. And if you're in that and within that, then, then do it in my name, live in my name, continue in my name, ask in my name, and you will see miraculous things happen, he says. All connected to what Jesus has been doing and doing what Jesus had been doing. Verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's back to that same thing, right? Right? Love like I have loved you. That was his command here. If you love me, you'll do what else I say. You'll keep my words. You'll love people. You'll do what I do. You'll continue the work I was doing my way. This is the main point of these whole five chapters. And Jesus comes back to it over and over and over. Here's the flow. I'm leaving, Jesus says. Here's what I want you to do. Love people like I loved you. This will be better for you. It will be stronger. It will be wider. It will be broader. Just keep doing the things that I've been doing. So what's their immediate next question? How? But but Jesus, you're leaving. How do we do that? So look what Jesus says in in the next bit, 14, starting in verse 16. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and he dwells in you. He dwells with you now and soon he will dwell in you. As Jesus says, this is going to be so much bigger, so much better, so many greater things than you've seen me do, you're going to do. Why? Because right now the Spirit is with you, but the Spirit's actually going to be in you. This would have been new for them. Jesus here says, love like I love, and in these chapters he says it six times. He says, in my name, six times in these chapters. He says, the helper will come five times in these chapters. But he says, he will be with you forever. I'm leaving. He won't. He actually talks a lot about the Holy Spirit here in the next couple of chapters. And every time he cycles around in this conversation and comes back to the Holy Spirit, he gives us more information about him. I'll come back to that in a minute. But I want to make sure you're with me so far. that I haven't confused you. Jesus tinks his glass, clears his throat, and says, I've got something I've got to say. I'm leaving. Here's what I want you to do. Right? I will send helper. 
just do what you've, you're supposed to do. Do what I've taught you to do. Continue my work. And then look at verse, verse 18. Where did it go? I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet in a little while the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, also you will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and that you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by his Father, and I will love him and manifest himself to me. He pretty much goes through the whole thing again right there. And I want you to see this cycle that goes back and forth here. Lock that in your head. I'm leaving. Love like I loved. Do what I have done, and the helper will come. Now let's go back and talk about the helper. In verse 16, it says, I will give you a helper. That word helper uh, could, could just as equally be translated and probably says, if you have a note at the bottom of your page in your Bible, uh, advocate is another word for the same thing, but so is counselor. And, and that makes sense. If you're going to a counselor, that's an advocate and a helper. It's, it's the same idea, right? Um, but he will be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. He dwells with you. Soon he will dwell in you. And Jesus says, I'm not abandoning you. This is actually going to be better. And then each time Jesus comes back around, he talks more about the Holy Spirit. If you look in, in verse 26, in verse 26 of chapter 14, he comes back around and again. This time he says that the Holy Spirit will come and teach you all things. He will remind you of all of the things we've talked about. And then it says, the Father is going to send him in my name. There's that same phrase again. The Father is going to send the Spirit, and it's going to be in the context of who Jesus is, his heart, his character, his passions, his priorities, his actions. The Spirit will come in that. Does that make sense? Because we see this phrase in his name over and over and over. His values, his deeds, his examples, his desires, his commands, his hearts, his longing. So whether we're praying or doing or serving or teaching or loving or giving or healing, it's in the name of Jesus. And, and, and he talks about the Holy Spirit here in, in chapter 14, verse 16, in fourteen twenty six, in chapter 15, verse 26, in, in chapter 16, verse 7. And in, in 16, verse 7, this last time he comes back around to the Holy Spirit coming, he says the words, this is to your advantage. Yes, it's hard for you, I'm leaving, but this is to your advantage. And he's driving that home. This will be even better than having with me with you physically. Do you think they could get their heads wrapped around that? In 1427, in the middle of all of this, he's on his third time around this rotation of, I'm leaving, love people, do what I want you to do, the helper is coming. And the third time around that, he says, okay, peace, peace I give you. Not like the world knows peace, I'm giving you my peace. Hold on here, don't worry about this, this is good. And then, at the end of chapter 14, they leave the upper room. So all of that in the context of the upper room, they've finished supper, they're sitting around talking, and Jesus is trying to get his point across. Do you know now what the main point was? Love people like I loved you. Continue the work that I started. So they leave the upper room. In the beginning of chapter 15, they, they, they are walking towards the garden where Jesus would be arrested. And on that walk, according to John's gospel, they continue this conversation. So pick up right where they were. They've had this conversation. They're now outside and they're walking. And they're going towards the garden and they go through vineyards. And Jesus stops in the middle of the vineyard. And he picks up, maybe he picks up a branch and there's grapes hanging on it. And he holds this and he stops and turns to them and says, okay, think about this. Think about this. Right? Giving them an object lesson here. It's chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. 
Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you, but abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, and apart from me, you can do nothing. You can picture Jesus trying to make this same point, right? Now he's got a physical thing they can look at and they can see and they can figure out, I am the vine, you're the branch, produce fruit, okay? And, he, and what are the, some of the things he says there? He says, you're going to be pruned, Anybody here like that part of life? You got growth happening. And it's good growth. And new leaves are coming out and everything. And Jesus, he says, God is, the Father is the gardener. He's going to come up and start pruning that and cutting off things in our life. Why? So that the, the, it can actually be more productive. But some of those things are the things that we love are coming into our life. And he's saying, oh, we're cutting that off. None of us like that. But that's the reality. That's the truth of what God does. The Father will shape us into what he needs for the sake of his kingdom. And then Jesus says, abide in me. In the same way that the branch attached to the vine, uh, you think of this time of year, the, the sap is coming up the trees and it's feeding the branches and, and, and some of the trees already have buds and it's going to push the leaves out. It's all because of the source, right? Right? And apart from that, what happens to a branch when it's apart? It dries up, right? It dries up, it starts to die on its own, it gets brittle and hard, it falls off. Let's think about that this week, and you know what? Anybody feel like that in your life? Dried up? Brittle, fallen off the... You know, that, that's exactly this picture here. When we're not connected to the source, abide simply means live there. It's completely connected. We've talked about this before too, and I said a simple example is I live in Canada. I live in Canada. I shop in Canada. I work in Canada. I pay taxes in Canada. My kids go to school in Canada. Everything I do is in Canada. That's abide. I abide in Canada. Translate that to abide in Christ. Everything I do, everything I am is in. That's, that's Canadian, Christian. That's what that means, to abide in that. And everything is in that context. And that's what Jesus is saying. You step outside of that, you can't do what I'm asking you to do. You can't do it. It's impossible. It'll dry up and fall off. Verse 11, Jesus says, I'm telling you this so that you will have joy. And not just joy, that your joy would be complete and full. This is way better for you. And then, and then the next couple of verses, 15, 12, back to the commandment, love like I loved you. And verse 17 again, back to the commandment again, love like I loved you. Again and again and again, 50, five times in, in this one dialogue, he comes back to that. So let me say this again for fear of my own repetition. Jesus stands up, he takes the class, clears his throat and says, I've got something important I want to say. I'm leaving. Here's what I want you to do. Love people like I loved you. Continue the work that I started. Do what I do. I will send the helper. He's saying here, for the last three years, I've been right here. We can look each other in the eye. We can talk about things. You can see it. I can show you. I can explain it. He says, that's all going to change. It's going to be so much better because it's going to be alive in you. So much better than walking alongside you. But what he's saying is, you will have a direct line to my power. You will see greater things for the sake of the kingdom. School is done. Disciples are graduating. 
I'm stepping back, and now you continue to do the work exactly the same way I did. That's what Jesus is trying to tell them. Look at verse, or chapter 16, verse 29. Because after chapter 13, 14, 15, and they're at the end of chapter 16, the disciples say what there? Oh! Okay, now you're talking straight. How many times did he have to go around and around and around and around so they got it? And then in verse 32, Jesus says, they probably arrived where they needed to be arrived. And Jesus says, my hour is here. You're going to be scattered. This is going to be incredibly tough. But take joy because I have overcome the world. They arrive at the garden and Jesus says, let me pray for you guys. In chapter 17, a couple of months ago, I think it was February 3rd, we spent the whole Sunday morning looking at that prayer and worked through it and his priorities that he teaches those things, same priorities. Jesus actually just prays for exactly what they need to do what he's just asked them to do. You know, here's your purpose. Stick together, be in unity, God protect them. And he says, I'm leaving, Father, but they're staying here. So sanctify them, purify them, give them the power, give them the unity, give them the strength to do what? To make my love known to the world. That's exactly what Jesus prays. So let me ask you, the series we've called Passion. What is Jesus' passion? What are we seeing here? How does that translate to us? Jesus wants people to be reconciled to God. He wants people to know the love of the Father. And so in, this, in these few short chapters, he repeats this five times, around and around and around until they get it. He says, love God, love people, make God known. I'll send you the Spirit. You cannot do it without this help. It won't be easy but don't worry. Do as I ask. Do as I've done. Love people like I loved you. Stay deeply connected. Abide in me. I am the source of your life. Everything you do, do in my name, in my way, in my character, according to who I am. Continue to do my work. Tell, share, build the kingdom, spread the word, spread the love. Why? Because people got to be restored in their relationship with God. As we've seen in, in, in Palm Sunday, when Jesus was riding in on the donkey and stopped and wept when he saw Jerusalem, because they missed it. And then last week in the upper room about the new covenant and the, and, and the, and the broken body and the blood as he forecasts his death and talks about that, about the, the saving rescue, we see the same thing. We see the same passion and priority of Jesus above everything else. Three weeks in a row, in the last week of life, it comes back and back and back. Jesus says people need to be restored to the relationship with God. They will do that first through love. This is going to be messy, and you're going to screw up. If we went back to the beginning there of this, of this passage where he, he tells Peter that he's going to deny him before the rooster crows, I wonder if, if he said that right out in front of everybody, or if at that point he leaned into Peter and just kind of whispered that one-on-one to Peter. Well, I, we don't know. It's in chapter 18 where we see that happen. And in, 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 in a very short order, he denies Christ three times. Can you imagine what happened inside of Peter after the third time, uh, but then he hears the bird crow? Can you imagine what happened right there? It says that he looked up, and Jesus looked up, and their eyes met. And, and, and you could just imagine time stopped. Everything went into slow motion. Can you, can you feel the gut-wrenching that went on inside of Peter there? Now look at verse, uh, chapter 21 if you feel like fast-forwarding there. Chapter, one verse, or chapter 21, verse 3, Peter makes a declaration. This is after Jesus 
has, has been arrested. He's denied him. He's been arrested. He's been uh, tried, sort of. He's been crucified. And what's Peter say in 21 verse 3? I'm going fishing. That's what Peter was before Jesus called him. I, I, I'm going back. I'm going back. Maybe it's because I've screwed up so much. Maybe because this is all over. This is done. What a waste of three years. I'm going fishing. They go fishing. A couple of others went with them. If you read that story, they fished all night. They caught nothing. They're heading back to shore, and they see a man on the shore they didn't know was Jesus. He says, throw your nets on the other side, and they do. And what they know as a fisherman, he knows that more than he knows anything else in the world. He is capable, and he's got zero until Jesus is there. And then Jesus says, come on, let's have breakfast. And Jesus, in a beautiful, really gentle way, in a conversation, looks at Peter. Actually, he calls Peter Simon there, which is his old name before Jesus, he met Jesus. So Simon, he's gone back to his old life. Jesus gives him his old name back and says, Simon, do you love me? And you work your way through that conversation. You come to the end of it at verse 19 there. And what does Jesus say? He looks him in the eye and says, follow me which is what he said to him three years before. A complete full circle. You have screwed up so bad. You're gut-wrenched, you're done, you've gone back to your old life, and Jesus comes back with the same invitation. Follow me. The invitation of complete reinstatement. A complete start all over, complete forgiveness, complete restoration. And he calls us to that same thing because you know what? Anybody need that too? Follow me. He calls us to forgiveness, to his love and his grace. Love God. Love people. Make sure Jesus' work continues until he comes back. Whether we screw up or we don't screw up, if we screw up, come back. And to oversimplify it, probably as it has for the last five years, oversimplify it with this. Listen to Jesus and do what he says. We've called this the Passion Series. It's the last opportunity Jesus had to speak with his disciples, to share his heart with his closest followers. We see clearly his purpose and his priorities. But at what point does his passions become my passions and your passions? At what point does his passions become our passions, individually and collectively? Let me go back to what he said in chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. What does this really look like today? What does this really look like for you what it, th- this, there is no permission for us to ever choose somebody and cross them off that list. This is love, like Jesus loved. If you want to read a really good book about this, I don't very often say read really good books. Um, Everybody Always by Bob Goff. That's all it is. It's about stories of, of loving people. Even as far as talks about uh, going to Uganda and beginning to love witch doctors. You know what? Loving people like Jesus did is going to be messy. It's going to be hard. It's going to be high risk. But this is what he's asking us to do. To do this. To be this. I think we all have stuff like Peter that's out of alignment with who Jesus is. And, and, and to live in his name. I think there's stuff that we have to get pruned off and let him prune off. Next week, it's on Friday, we talk about why did Jesus have to die. We're going to give you the opportunity to write down some things that need to die in me. Well, not just in me. You can write them what needs to die in me if you want. But you... 
write down some things in you that are out of alignment with God that need to die and be buried with Jesus. We'll deal with that on Friday. And then on Sunday, what are the things that we need Jesus desperately to revive in us? And maybe this love for people is one of them. As we look at the new life that came through Jesus, let's pray. Jesus, my prayer is that you don't have to say your highest priorities to us over and over and over and over and over so we get it. God, we pray that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we would know you, that we would know your truth, that we would know your priorities and your passions, that they would quickly become us because you dwell in us. It's Ephesians chapter 3, that prayer that we would have inner strength, that we would know the fullness of Christ in us and Christ dwelling in us, that we would be rooted and grounded in love and that we would know the height and the depth and the breadth of Jesus' love for us, that we would know the fullness of God, that we might be your people, that people around us and in our town would know that we are yours because of the way we love. May God do your work in us. Help us to see and to understand the priorities of Christ. They are his passions that need to become my passions, that need to become our passions. So Father, feel free to do your work in us. As much as we hate the pruning shears, uh, have at it to make us more like Jesus.